Um, is it recording? All right, so the most important thing is we always talk about inspecting your bees. And so could I ask whose speaker that is? I don't know how to find that out. Robert, do you know whose speaker that is? We need everybody muted, please. speaker is making uh, a lot of loud noises and so I don't want to talk over it if they if everyone could just turn off your your or mute your button that would be fantastic Hold on. all right there we go <laughs> okay sorry about that um, so this change and I can't go back Robert It needs to go back a slide. It got changed when you were doing that. Do you know how to do that or are you waiting for me? All right, there we go. Sorry about that. We will figure this out, I promise. <clears throat> so the most important thing is finding out if your hive is queen right. Um, the, the thing that is the most important thing, though, is that when you're trying to find out if your hive is okay or not, it's not absolutely necessary for you to actually see your queen. A lot of people struggle um, being able to just find that one bee out of the entire hive, and especially as the hive grows throughout the season, it's really hard, hard to locate her. So there's actually different things that you can do to almost guarantee that she's probably in there, or at least has been in there within the last uh, certain amount of time. Um, the biggest thing is, are you seeing eggs? If you're seeing eggs down inside of the cell, then your queen has been there within three days. And then you can kind of um, observe what the frame looks like. If you're seeing eggs in there, but you're also seeing some type of supersedure or swarm cell or something like that, well then now your risk goes up that there's a possibility maybe your queen might not be in the box. But if you're not seeing any other tail signs of something else going on, you can almost say, hey, my queen is probably in here unless you accidentally squish her yourself. Um, also, by looking at the brood, your brood tells you a story. Every time you open up your hive, your brood is in different stages. So you have your eggs, and then after so about nine days for the worker brood, they cap off those worker, um, worker cells. So if you're opening up your hive and you don't see eggs and you're only seeing some stages of larva, um, then you can kind of say, okay, well, it hasn't been nine days, but it's definitely been more than three. And so you can use the, the brood to actually determine how long it's been he was inside of the hive. I think it's Joseph's iPhone is doing that. Um, and so then when you are pulling out your frames and you're looking at that brood, look at the health of your brood. That is what you're looking for when you're pulling those frames out one by one. You're observing and seeing what are the bees doing on those frames and what does it look like? Is there a good pattern? Is there a bad pattern? The, if you're looking at your colony and you're seeing all the cells filled and uh, all of the frames have either honey or pollen on them and everything is, is looking very healthy, like the pictures that you see online, then you can kind of determine the strength of your queen. If you're looking and seeing, um, here's some pictures right over here to, I don't know if you guys can see my screen the way I do, I have to move things. But to the right, um, at the top, you can see a spotty brood pattern. If I were to open my hive and look inside and see that spotty brood pattern, I know something is wrong and I need to fix it immediately. Um, and then if you look down to the bottom right and you can see that the cells are open and some of them are chewed through, that's another sign, hey, you know, this, this might have looked like a little bit more filled in brood, but you can see holes being chewed through some of those and the little white larva sticking out that has obviously died. If you're watching and observing your brood, you'll be able to catch those things, um, especially if you're inspecting your bees every seven to 10 days. I'm going to tell you that probably a million times, inspect your bees from June until August at least, every seven to 10 days, and then that way you can stay ahead of them and not constantly feel like you're trying to catch up with them. 
Um, but when you are looking at your brood, what you're looking for are different types of issues. If you're not seeing issues, that's great. A lot of us won't, but some of us will. And when you're looking at that, you'll be able to determine, is this a bacterial infection? Is this a chalk brood? Is this a mite issue? If you can see the center of the screen, there are three bees there that look super greasy. That's a huge mite issue. If I open up a colony, and I have in the past, where I'll open it up and I see so many greasy bees, I know that this hive has a mite issue, but also it may not be that the mites are living directly on the bees. The queen was most likely infected with a virus from mites, and therefore her offspring is going to have issues, and therefore you're getting things like the greasy bees or the black shiny bees. So if you're seeing a lot, I mean, you might see one or two, no big deal, but if you're seeing a lot of them, then you probably have an issue in your hive. And in that situation, if you are dealing with a lot of greasy bees, you would want to replace your queen as soon as possible because your queen is most likely the issue. The population of your bees tells you a lot. If you're opening up, uh, I actually have a client who contacted me and he has two hives. One hive is thriving, one hive is not. One hive is in two deeps, one hive is still in a deep after over a month. Well, if your hive still hasn't moved out of a deep after over a month, there's probably an issue. And having two hives, you can compare one by the other and say, well, this hive is an overachiever, so it's doing great, but this hive is like really, really not doing well. So you could always borrow supplies from the one like brood or eggs or something. But a lot of times you don't want to boost a hive that's weak because all you're trying to do is boost a hive to make it through the year so that they can die over the winter. You really don't want to boost bees that already look like they're dying. If your queen is not producing the way that she should and your hive has not moved to the second deep by mid June, you probably have an issue and the best result on that is just to pluck off your queen and get a new one. And that's not always the case, but for the most, most part, your queen is going to be the person that's producing all of your brood inside of your hive. So then the other thing is how important is knowing how much room that you have to have. I hear all the time people not giving enough room or giving too much room. You should never stick a hive in with all of their boxes. You know, they have to build up to it. But I also see a lot of people who don't give the bees enough space and enough time, and then they're constantly dealing with swarming. So just so you know, just a, a way to kind of stay ahead of the game is if you have a 10 frame box, you would want to watch. And once they're on eight of the 10 frames, then you're going to want to put your second box on. If it's a, an eight frame, which is my own preference, you would look at six out of the eight. So if you had happened to buy a nuke this year and you have eight frame equipment, you put five frames inside that eight frame box, you might as well just go ahead and throw that next one up. I know it's not quite six, but you're gonna stay a little bit ahead of the game. Now you don't wanna put a medium on top of that because then they have two empty boxes. Having two empty boxes would then be a little too excessive on space and you might deal with small hive beetle or you could also deal with robbers later on in the year. All right. Uh, Emily, if you have a minute here, I wanna interrupt real quick. Uh, for the officers, of the association, um, getting a lot of emails. I'm responding to the emails. People are not able to log in. Uh, I'm fixing their issues, but if somebody can please watch the Facebook feed in case somebody is not able to log in, please send them the uh, link to the um, to the meeting. My husband's unable to sign in too, but oh well, he can hear me. <laughs> Um, so the, the big thing that um, I tell people is, honestly, it's hive management through the summer, but it's actually swarm prevention, because that's what you're basically trying to do. Your bees just want to build up, and they want to put honey inside of their hive, and they want to have all of this food, and they want to grow, and your job as a beekeeper is to basically prevent them from growing so much that they want to swarm. So you're able to do different things to be able to manipulate that. But the one thing that I, I do try to address pretty often is, is swarming that bad? And the answer is that obviously you don't really want your bees to swarm because there's a lot of things that you're losing out on. You're losing out on the cost of those bees. So your hive that was one became two. You could have had two colonies, but you just wasted half of them and you're not guaranteed that the remaining colony will be able to produce another one. 
But I always address this because the reason I started my company was because I kept hearing about all the swarms in the cities that were being killed because people are deathly afraid of bees if they don't realize what they are or they don't realize how gentle and docile they are or how important they are. All they know is that there are bees in their area and they are scared to death. So I started the company to come out and remove these swarms for free. And a lot of times what I'm finding is that beekeepers become overwhelmed with all of the bees or they're a little bit too nervous to go through their hive. And so they just kind of allow their bees to swarm. So I always recommend to people, don't allow your bees to swarm um, intentionally, because, especially if you're in the city. If you're in the city, what happens when you're doing that is you're exposing all of these people who are afraid and then they all talk. And then in the, in the long run, an ordinance happens to be uh, written up to control the amount of swarms that are going to be inside the city. So if you're allowing your bees to swarm, you're kind of actually um, harming your own beekeeping ability because the city is going to end up cracking down on beekeepers allowing to have bees within the area. Um, a, a big thing is do you feed or do you not feed once you get into the honey flow? And so what I tell people is you can feed your bees until you are full into your brood chamber. So a lot of people like to do two deeps. So you can go ahead and you can feed your bees until you hit two deeps. But once we hit a honey flow, you have to be extremely cautious about how much you are feeding them. And there's two reasons, major reasons why. One is if you have feed on them while they have feed coming in very rapidly, they're going to do what's called backfilling. And the picture that you can see on the screen is a, an example of backfilling where the brood is emerging out and the moment that brood comes out, they're backfilling it with nectar because they don't have enough space and they actually don't have enough time to move it up to wherever it needs to go. So they bring it in and they drop it right there in the place. So the other thing though is that when you are feeding your bees and you have a honey super up on top, your sugar water will become your honey and it's not really honey. And you don't want to feed your bees sugar water to create honey because it's not a, a, a natural way that you're producing honey. It's a fake honey, which is kind of what people ask on a regular basis. When I'm buying your honey, what is your honey? Are you feeding your bees? No, I don't feed my bees because I want to make sure that my honey is coming from the nectar source as much as possible. Um, and then also I'd like to recommend to people to don't have front feeders on your hive after May. It entices robbers to come and start checking out the bees. Um, and then they will pay attention and see if the hive ever gets weak or if your hive swarms, they can go ahead and move in and rob the colony out later on in the year. A front feeder is basically an advertisement for other bees to say, hey, there's free food right here. Come on and stop by for some. Um, and especially if you put something like honeybee healthy in there where it's going to entice them with lemongrass or cause these bees to come looking for it. If you have a front feeder on, you're almost kind of setting up a death trap for your bees after May. Then you can also realize that there are um, ways to watch for swarming and find out if you're going to have bees swarm before they actually get to that state. And it's a matter of paying attention to all of the signs and symptoms of your hive first. Um, the big thing is drone production. You'll open your hive and it was like everything was worker brood and everything was kind of slow. And then all of a sudden it just seems like your hive is really building up and there's a lot of drone everywhere. That's your first sign that your hive is saying, we're getting ready to reproduce. Your bees know two weeks before they actually swarm that they're going to. Um, a really great book is uh, The Honeybee Democracy by Seeley. If you ever want something to read about swarms, fantastic information in there. Um, but it kind of explains to everyone the, the process of swarming, why they swarm, how they swarm, and all of those amazing little methods that, that they're doing. Um, Backfilling is your second sign. So like I said, the picture right there is backfilling. So if you're opening your hive, now you're seeing a bunch of drone. Now you're seeing backfilling. Backfilling is kind of the, the, the uh, straw before the camel breaks, you know, kind of situation because it's telling you, hey, we don't have enough room. And at the same time that your bees are backfilling and especially this much like is on the picture, your bees are also thinning out your queen. And what that means is that they reduce her diet and they also chase her around the hive. And when they do that, um, they're thinning her out so that she can fly. And so they, they've already been preparing long before you knew that they were going to swarm. And then your final answer is 
swarm cups. First, they will put the cups there on the bottom and they will not have eggs in them. And you have a few days typically to, to pay attention and realize what's going on. So you've seen brood, you ignored it, you, or a drone, I'm sorry. You saw backfilling and you ignored it. Now you have your swarm cells. So for two weeks, there were signs presenting beforehand to tell you that your bees might swarm. So those are the signs and things that you need to pay attention to when you're doing your inspections. Um, also, the queen cell location, if it's a swarm, and I'm going to get into this in the next thing, uh, you'll typically have them in one location. And if it's an emergency or supersedure cell, it will also be in a different location. And I will explain that here in just one second. All right, so I'm trying to figure out where I can move this screen and not be in the way. Because does this, can you, does this block it for you guys too when I do that? It's perfect for us now. All right, that's great. So swarm cell versus supersedure cell. And uh, this might be old news for some of you, but uh, the newer people might not know. And so I always try to address it so that when you are going through your hive, a lot of us are, are scared in the beginning because it's very intimidating. There's a lot of bees, there's a lot of stuff going on. And we're trying to remember everything that we were supposed to say and do and watch for when you're opening up the colony. So this is one of the things that if you see this in your hive, something is going on. If you see giant peanut shaped cells, those are queen cells. Now, if you look in the bottom right, on the right hand side, you can see the cells down in the bottom, or the, the swarm cells, but to the right, you can see the drone. So there's a huge comparison there where the drone is actually like a uh, popcorn style and the queen cells are peanut. And a lot of people kind of confuse them when the drone cells get built out on the end. So if they're not hanging downward, then they're probably not swarm cells. But you, you can always take a picture and post it on Facebook onto like Ohio beekeepers or Summit County beekeepers. And there are people that are out there and willing to answer questions like that and help you out. Um, so the location of these cells is going to tell you uh, what's going on. Is it an emergency situation or is it a space issue? And when I say that, that I mean, when you're seeing them at the very bottom of your frames, that typically means these, this is swarms. These bees have, do not have enough space. And if you look at that bottom picture where the swarm cells are hanging down to the bottom of the frame, you can see that there's a lot of backfilling. Oh, and guess what? There's drone to the right. The bees were really trying to fill in all of that space because they were bringing in the nectar too quickly. Now the ones on the top, those I would assume on the left hand side is an emergency situation because it's mid frame and especially on the right where you can see the brood doesn't look so great either and then you have these last attempts to create these swarm cells and those swarm cells look like they're not the best, they're kind of unhealthy and if I were to see those cells mid frame like that, I know I'm having an issue with my uh, queen. But not all swarm cells that you see inside your hive mean that your bees are going to be swarming. If you look down at the very bottom picture where the swarm cells are at, you can see there are five. The second one in from the left is a very tiny little cell. And that one probably will never get filled with an egg and it'll probably never be drawn out the, the full way. And most likely once this whole situation happens where these queens emerge, that cell will probably still remain there because it was never filled. So it kind of becomes like a backup cell to just hang out. So do pay attention when you are looking and you see a swarm cell um, it, that does not have an egg and it does not have any production to it. Well, they probably just have this extra cell hanging out there. Now one, maybe two throughout the whole hive, no big deal. When you're starting to see them on a lot of frames, that's your, your sign that maybe they're going to swing, uh, swarm. Sorry. Um, your brood health is going to tell you a lot about what is going on as well in that hive. Like I had said, the top one to the right, it doesn't look very healthy, but the one on the bottom definitely looks like it's doing very well. So I would assume swarming probably on the bottom, not swarming on the top because my bees are not going to want to swarm if their health is failing. 
Capped queen cells typically also mean that you don't have a queen inside of your hive. So the, the procedure of bees and what they do when they've decided that they're going to swarm is they start the swarm cells and then on day nine, they're capping off those queen cells. The day that they cap those queen cells, they leave. And it's because they know that these queens are taken care of, they're going to be reproducing, and so they can easily leave the hive and know that whatever is remaining will be able to make a new queen. However, that um, is going to be an issue if you have way too many queen cells in there um, because you're gonna have a multi-virgin emerging from multiple different cells. So if you are seeing the swarm cells at the bottom of your hives, you are going to want to remove them down to just a few. I do cover that a little bit later on as well. And then what happens if you just decide to let your bees swarm? Like I had mentioned, it induces panic within the city limits. We all have our experiences where we've all lost uh, swarms. I guarantee you I have lost plenty, especially when I'm collecting them um, constantly from locations. I'll bring them home and then they disappear by the time I get back. So it, there's times that you can't control it and especially when your hive splits. And even if you only had two cells, you might get two virgins queens that emerge. And when that situation happens, you can't control that extra swarm. So I just encourage people do everything that you can to help prevent it, but it will probably happen to you at some point. Just try not to make it intentional. Um, the best management practices for beekeeping here, I think I can, how do I um, reduce my screen so I can show them the link? One hit second. escape. Like hit escape from your screen, maybe. Thank there you. There you go. All right. And so, which one was I doing? Uh, what if my bees swarm? Within, okay, so the Ohio Best Management Practices, I might not have pulled it up here, but if you guys go to the Ohio Department of Agriculture website, Right here, you will be able to find all of the information of the rules and laws that you're supposed to abide by for the state of Ohio. Now, each city will make their own as well, um, which will further restrict you, but you're ever wondering what is the, what am the proper care that I'm supposed to have for my bees, you'll be able to go onto this website. You can register from this website. You can file for an inspection from this website. You can list yourself as a uh, nuke or a queen seller. All of that type of situations is all here on the apiary program, Ohio Department of Agriculture. So, but right down here is your best management practices form or a website. And if you scroll down, I lied. It will give you the list. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing your what you're showing. You still have the slides on my screen. Hey Robert, how do I um that, that oh, mine is probably shared uh, okay one moment. Sorry, it's my first Zoom presentation. I swear I'm trying to make this right. <laughs> So we're going to share the entire screen, okay, versus um, versus just a, a slide or a window. Can you see it now? Yeah. Perfect. All right. Sorry about that. So here is the website, the Ohio Department of Agriculture. And right down here, these are just different links that you can click on for your registration, inspections, and then the best management practices. And if you didn't know that they exist, I highly recommend getting on there and reading through them and just kind of knowing what the, the basic foundation for beekeepers should be in the state of Ohio. All right, so back here. But like I was saying, your, your proper hive management can prevent swarming. So instead of calling it summer management, I'm going to call it summer swarm management because to be honest, that's kind of what we're dealing with all summer long is trying to prevent your bees from growing too large, too fast and swarming and leaving you uh, with just half your colony. So between June and September, I highly recommend really being in your bees and observing them every seven to 10 days. And by doing that, like I had mentioned, the, the cells get capped on day nine. So staying ahead of your bees by being in there every seven to 10 days will most likely be, uh, help you to, to, my kids are elephants upstairs, sorry. Um, 
help you to find out uh, what's going on inside your hive. So between summer and spring, there is a very strong flow, typically between May and June. We are in it right now. Um, when you're driving down the road and you are seeing giant uh, trees in bloom, like the black locust is in bloom, the autumn olive is in bloom, the honeysuckle is in bloom, all of these bushes and trees, uh, dandelions are over now, but there is some clover going on. Um, this is all food sources for your bee. So this means that we are in a honey flow. So when you're driving down the road and you see a whole bunch of flowers, the answer is yes, we have honey coming in very rapidly. So if you're seeing that, just get on top of your bees and make sure that they have enough room to be in, um, bringing in the honey and putting a honey super up on top. And then you're going to find that between sometime around June, towards the end of June through July, we often have kind of a drop off of no food, um, especially if it gets really, really hot or it starts raining quite a bit. Uh, we won't really have too many food sources, but then we get the um, aster and the goldenrod blooming in mid to August, and it goes sometimes all the way until October, but your strongest flow is going to be August and September. So it's just uh, kind of being prepared. You can't ever say what day it's going to start, but you can kind of just pay attention to watching all these things blooming and you will know, oh, we must be in a honey flow. The other thing is that you really need to check for mites. Mites is a very, uh, uh, it's the biggest bee killer there is. A lot of people lose colonies every winter and they say, I did everything right. My hive was strong, all of these things that I did but I didn't do any type of management for mites. And it's now we kind of know a little bit more research about how the fat is actually being sucked out of them through the winter. And then that's why they're dying instead. So they can't maintain their heat and, and they become weak and they become sick. So it's very, very important to try to stay ahead of your mites. Um, you should test, test them at least once a month. Uh, there are tons of YouTube videos online for you to watch it. If you see on my screen that little thing with the yellow cup, Blue Sky Bee Supply over in Ravenna, uh, they sell them for $20. It's the best invention and it'll last you forever. You just put alcohol on the bottom, you scoop your bees inside, you shake it up for a minute, you dump it out into a white bucket and, and count the mites. I know it sounds awful to have to kill your bees, but if you think by killing just half of a cup of bees once or twice a month is going to prevent losing the entire hive over winter, losing a little bit of bees really isn't that big of a deal because you are saving so many more. Um, by being in your hive and paying attention and, and, and manipulating your frames and all of these things that I'm gonna just talk about here in a second, you can stay ahead of the bee space. So um, if you decide or if, if something happens where you're not able to uh, get that second box on top and you realize by the time you're out there, wow, they filled this hive up much faster than I thought, you can actually take a medium and put it in between your deep, your, your top and your bottom or your mediums, whichever ones you're running, and get them to start drawing on that medium and then bump it back up to the top. And that will kind of help your bees uh, realize, oh, we have more space, so we don't have to worry about swarming right now, and uh, place it up on top. The other thing is manipulating your frames. And what I mean by that is when you're inspecting in the colonies, you're looking at your frames and say, you know, one on the far outside is empty, well, move it in one. If you move it in one, the bees don't want that empty space there, so they're gonna start drawing on that frame. Um, also, another thing is that if they're packing in tons of nectar down into your brood chamber, you can pull those frames out and store them somewhere temporarily until they need them. And then that way, they're not filling the bottom chamber with tons of honey and they're able to keep on drawing out more space. So manipulating your frames and adding in empty frames is going to help you stay ahead from your bees swarming throughout the year. Um, also, I wanted to mention that um, I see a lot of people posting that they're catching swarms up on Facebook. I do it on a regular basis because that's what we do with their company. And there's a few other people that like David Hatch, he does it as well, and Sean Brown. Um, and I think that there's some confusion sometimes about what we're doing and why we're doing it. And so I just kind of wanted to mention 
when we're when people are posting that they're catching these swarms, it's not a way of encouraging people to allow their bees to swarm. We're actually catching swarms that are typically feral, coming out of chimneys, coming out of trees, coming out of locations that they're not supposed to be in. Sometimes it is other beekeepers' bees that have traveled so far we don't know whose they are anymore. So when you're, um, some people get confused though they see it on Facebook, they're like, well, it must be a great thing because all these people are posting all these swarms that they're catching. Well, a lot of times they're not their bees. So we're not in trying to encourage people to allow their bees to swarm. And I just wanted to make sure that people understand the difference there. Um, and then just to also add, I am doing a swarm removal presentation um, on June 20th. I will be posting that on my Facebook page. If you guys uh, follow my Facebook page, Mueller Honeybee, and you'll be able to follow that uh, here in a couple weeks. So I've talked about the honey flow and I just kind of wanted to reiterate what that means. Uh, what is your honey flow? Like I said, you're driving down the road, you're seeing tons of blooms and blossoms. Uh, your strongest flow is going to be from your trees because they are really mass producing all of your flowers. Clover is really, I mean, it's great, it's wonderful, but it's not going to really supply the nectar that your bees need. Um, is it the same time every year? Nope, it's usually within a couple of weeks. And if you would really like to find out what is blooming in your area, there is this wonderful uh, website from uh, OARDC. It's called the Phenology Calendar. And let me see if I can click this and it opens. Okay, so you guys can see this, right? Yes. Let me make sure. So what I, what I would do is I would go to this calendar and I'm going to type in my zip code 44319, show me the calendar. And right here, it's going to tell me within this last week, what has started blooming in my area? What plants have started budding? What insects and invasive species are actually destroying some of these things? Um, and you can change the date. Like if you wanted to know the first time that anything bloomed, you can scroll all the way back. Oops. Actually, you can go to different years. I forgot that too. So but it's just a really, really awesome um, tool. So I'm scrolling over to May 4th. So on May 4th, if anybody remembers, viburnum was, was blooming, spiria was blooming, azaleas were blooming. So if you just wanted to know perhaps what nectar source your bees are bringing in or what type of tree it is that you're seeing, any type of plants, it should all be on this website. It is the Ohio State University's phenology calendar. So I highly recommend saving this so that you can find those things out on your own later on. Oops, and I did want to mention, and this is something I, I mean, I've been doing this a long time. I learned today that a bee or the, a beehive can actually produce up to five gallons of honey in one day. That's crazy. I, bees always blow my mind. So what will happen eventually sometime in your life is that your bees will swarm and you'll probably go, oh, what do I do now? And so I just kind of wanted to address that because it will happen to the best of us. And I kind of want to give you some tools and things to, to have along the way so that you know and what to do and be prepared. So immediately open up your hive and find out what's going on. You're probably going to find tons of swarm cells. So if you're finding tons of swarm cells, you're gonna want to knock them down because if you can see the bottom picture, there are just six right there um, in that one picture and that's just one frame. A really, really strong colony is probably going to have six to up to 20 sometimes per frame and you're usually having four to eight frames of brood per chamber. Uh, so that's a lot of swarm cells. You need to get inside of there and knock them all down uh, up and, except for one or two very, very strong, healthy, biggest cells that you can find because um, what will happen is those will all emerge out and they'll become virgin queen swarms. So the swarm up on top, that huge massive monster hive uh, that is resting on the branch is most likely a multi-virgin queen swarm. And the multi-virgin queen swarm one of my children are breaking in, um, means that you have all of these virgins coming out and they're traveling with these bees and uh, they are going to, I'm so sorry. Well, where's my husband? That's okay, Emily, it's not too bad. Um, so then, um, Sorry, I got sidetracked because one of my helpers came in. Swarm cells open. Um, if you're looking at these frames down here, that there are six swarm cells on that bottom frame, 
and you can see one emerged out of the bottom. It was chewed open in like a little perfect circle. That means that that queen came out of that cell. And then if you look to the right, you can see that the sides, those other five or six of them, look like they were ripped open from the side. And what that means is that virgin queen came out on the left, and then she immediately went to the right and killed every single one of those cells, uh, one of those queens, and then the bees came in and they tore down the cells. So the queen in the situation on the far left won and uh, has overtaken the hive. The thing is, is that after your bees swarm and then this happens, well, when are you going to see a new queen? And it's going to be quite a while. I hear every year about these people who um, bought a queen, but they didn't realize that they didn't wait long enough and they, the bees ended up killing off that $30 to $45 queen, depending on where you get them from. So when will you see a new queen? Um, usually it's going to be, so your, your bees cap on day nine, and then it's going to be six to seven more days for those that virgin to emerge. Then it's going to take her up to a week to mate. And then one more week for that newly mated queen to start laying eggs. What, baby? Okay, you're supposed to be upstairs with daddy. Because. So in that situation, when you have a bunch of swarm cells and you know that you don't want to wait that time frame for a new queen to come back and you're losing three to five weeks of production on honey, then can you add a queen? Yes, but it's also extremely complicated to add a queen because that pheromone that's in there in all of those cells. And what you have to do is you have to go through every single frame and knock down every single cell. So you don't want them to get to the point that they're emerging. Once they start emerging, it's over. Now they're going to start the process on their own and you're gonna to have to wait until that queen comes back from her mating flight and, and deal with it from there. So what you wanna do is stay ahead of your bees, inspect them on a regular basis, and you'll be able to prevent these things before that they happen. Um, so the other recommendation that I have for when you think that your bees are going to swarm is go inside your hive, knock down any cells that you're seeing, and then cage your queen. Cage that queen for about a week and possibly longer, it depends. They will feed her, they will take care of her, and um, you need to uh, sorry, my kid's in here and it's throwing me off. Um, keep her in a cage in there and it will cause the bees to stop wanting to swarm because they can't run the queen out of the hive because she is locked up. Come get Weston. I am texting my husband to tell him to come get my child. So let's take this opportunity, guys. Do you, do you have any questions? If you have a question, go ahead, unmute yourself and ask it. Uh, I know I get asked a lot, uh, especially with new beekeepers, Emily, they come in and they feed a lot. They don't know when to stop feeding. Next thing you know, the, the brood chamber is filled with nectar, or maybe not, it's not the case. Maybe there is some syrup in there and you know they, we've told them every time you see eight frames drawn and add, and you see bees on eight frames, go ahead and add a second box. And so I see people where they add the second box but nothing happens. The bees don't go up there and they don't draw the wax. And so one method to do that, and we did that, Matt, uh, today, um, we, we would take, what you guys wanna do, you wanna take brood from the bottom box, you know, maybe one or two frames, and put them on the second box or in the second box, and that will encourage the bees to go up there. And bees do not like solid black foundation or white foundation right next to their brood. So they're gonna start drawing the frames next to your brood frame that you just moved upstairs. So, uh, you know, there's no formula where you can say, I'm gonna feed one quart or I'm gonna feed one gallon or two gallons. You have to inspect your hives, especially when you know, this is your first year. You gotta go in. Some people tell you don't go in. You gotta go in every two weeks. Don't go in too often. I go into my hives every Saturday morning. I, ins I fully inspect every single frame. And that's me and that's my method. And sometimes I catch problems before they become big problems. So see what works for you and what works for your schedule, but don't be afraid to go into the hive, look around, analyze it, figure out what you want to do. And if you have a question, post it on our Facebook or email us, and we'll be more than happy to assist. 
Randy has started a mentorship program where new beekeepers are assigned mentors in their area. So if you have a question, uh, you know, and you can't get a hold of somebody, get a hold of Randy, and he'll he'll get you connected with a neighbor or somebody in your neighborhood that's been doing beekeeping for more more than two or three years. Perfect. Um, and then one more thing I wanted to add is a lot of times I hear from somebody, I'll go to their house to help inspect their hive or whatever is going on and they'll say, well, I didn't see the swarm. That doesn't mean that they didn't swarm because if you're not standing outside from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m., then the chances of you catching it happening are not very common. Uh, you get very lucky if they do land and stay nearby, but that isn't always the case. So I wanted to just kind of discuss how can you stop the swarming behavior so that you can be prepared when the situation hits because I will guarantee that this year, anybody that was a second year is going to probably deal with this because of the massive amount of honey flow we have going on. If this is your first year beekeeping, you are super blessed because this honey flow is absolutely insane. This does not typically happen. It is a huge inflow right now of all of this nectar. So um, it's probably because of the warm uh, winter that we had. And then also we had a decent amount of rain, but not too excessive amounts of rain. Um, but so what you what we're discussing is watching for those swarm cells. So you look for your drone, you, you saw a drone happening and now you saw the back filling. Well, now you see these cups. If you see the cups and there's no eggs in it, you still have time, you can add room. You can pull out the deep frames of honey and you can add in empty frames in between the brew chamber. Now you don't wanna break your brew chamber apart too much. You wanna keep at least two frames together because your brew chamber has to stay warm for those babies. So if you were to do what's called checkerboarding where you're putting an empty one in between every other frame, you don't really wanna do that because those bees could get chilled and you might end up killing them instead. So I would at least keep two brewed together, empty frame, and then two more brewed. And then that way you're not giving them too much space and causing too much problems in there. So, however, if you want to stop a swarm after you are seeing eggs in the cups, you, like I had said, you have to knock down every single cell. You can cage your queen, but you cannot, absolutely cannot miss a cell. And if you do miss one cell and you put a queen in there, they will kill her and still proceed to allow their queen to override. Um, and then the best option that I tell people, and, it's, and if you're in a situation that you can, split your hive. I mean, it's, it's so much better to have two hives than it is to have one, and it just makes things easier. You're not gonna have to uh, keep on monitoring as closely and being stressed out about it. If you just split the bees, then you don't have to deal with it anymore, as long as it's a certain time frame of the year that they can build up high, like well enough. Um, I usually sell nukes all the way up until like the first or second week of August because they have uh, the rest of August, September, October, and sometimes even a little bit of November for me to feed them uh, to build up. So a small five frame nuke that I get in August or a swarm I get in that time frame, it's not really that big of a deal as long as you're feeding them um, as a small colony. Now your established bees, you don't want to feed those during your fall flow. Uh, if you, like we had mentioned before, if you're feeding your bees when there's a flow, you're going to push them into swarming typically. So, all right. Okay. Oh, Emily, you probably need to plug your laptop. It's going to die. Okay. I'm having all of the best luck in the world today. Let me uh, grab this. So while, while Emily is doing that, we have a question here from Cynthia. What happens when you add the second brood box and now you have six frames? fully drawn and they have bees on them, what do you do? Do you add a super? Uh, I, I would say yes. I usually add it when I have only three frames empty. So when I have seven or eight frames, I add my super. Uh, I do use queen excluders. Uh, there's uh, mixed emotions about that. And if you ask 10 beekeepers, you'll get 10 different answers on it. Some say that the queen excluder will hurt the wings of the bees. I have never had that problem. I use queen excluders because one, I inspect my hive on weekly basis. So I don't wanna be uh, inspecting four boxes, looking for the queen and figuring out where she's laying. So I, I use a queen excluder. So I don't even have to touch the top two 
uh, boxes. I actually use a single brood chamber. I started that last year and it works well for me. You just have to be really vigilant. You have to inspect on a regular basis because they can swarm on you in a heartbeat yep, very, uh, when very you quick. only have one, one brood chamber. But I do, I have one brood chamber. I have a, and I'm not advocating that by the way, it works for me and I give them a lot of my time so I'm able to monitor. And then I use the queen excluder, excluder and I put uh, three or four supers on top. And then just real quick, I want to touch just very, very lightly on successful splits. And that's just kind of give you a few tools to have in case you get into the situation, since I did talk about it. But um, splitting your hive is like an entire of its own class. So there's something that I have a lot of people tell me that they do. And a lot of times it's an inexperienced beekeeper that doesn't really know what they're doing when they're doing a split. So they do something called a walk away split. And it's, it's, to me, it's, it's just not going to help, uh, in my opinion, because you had all the tools, you're going through your hive, you could have just simply have made a little bit better of a situation. But what a walkaway split is, is where you have two brood chambers, and you can see it in the picture, where the guy's taking the top brood chamber off, and he's going to set it on the box to the right, and he's going to stick a top on the other hive, and he's going to walk away, is what you call it, and allow those hives to do their thing. The complication with doing this is that you haven't checked to see, are there eggs in both boxes? So being that hands off can actually shoot you in the foot because the bees don't even have all the resources they need to be able to make another hive. And instead you force them into becoming laying workers because they don't have eggs, they don't have brood, they have no way to make a queen, but you believe that you have split these bees and they'll do it on their own. The other complication is that your queen's still in her box, and if she felt like she was going to swarm, they still are going to swarm. If you haven't done anything to manipulate that box or to add more space, you're not preventing a swarm. You're just basically doing a three-way split. You're causing your hive to split itself, and you are splitting it as well. So just you want to make sure that when you're doing some type of split, if you want to do a walkaway split, check the resources inside that box first before you utilize it because you don't even know for sure if they can have all the tools that are inside that they need. Um, some tips to have while you're thinking about doing a split, and, and you might run into this situation where after this honey flow, a lot of these bees are going to want to reproduce or split themselves. Uh, is look for a, um, eggs in both hives. Uh, you want capped brood in both hives. And the reason that you really need to have capped brood in both hives is because those are your babies that are going to be emerging out to be taking care of your colony. So if you have all of your capped brood in one hive and no capped brood in the other hive, they're gonna have to wait 21 days from those eggs to turn into capped brood and become bees for them to start boosting up their numbers. So you're kind of setting them back by not allowing that capped brood to be inside both of the, the colonies. And then when you are allowing some one of the colonies to make a queen, you want the strongest colony to make a queen. You don't want to take a, a little tiny five frame nuke here. You have very limited resources, you have very limited eggs, you have very limited other things. Hey, Joseph, and, uh... um, so now you will not be able to make what you need out of that. Uh, Joseph, your phone is not on mute. Can you please mute it? One second, Emily, I'm taking over your computer. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, uh, this got bumped pretty far for some reason. And then when you have split your hive, then at that point, do you want to make or do you want to buy a queen? And when I originally started splitting my bees, I really wanted the experience of knowing how to make my own queens and the process of which the bees do. However, now that I'm a little bit more ahead of the game and I produce honey on a regular basis, I really just want to mate a queen inside of my hive because now I'm five weeks ahead. So before it used to be a thing where I was like, oh, I want my own bees and I want them to be openly mated with my own drones and it's gonna be wonderful. Now I just want the easy way out because I don't have to 
wait five weeks. Five weeks is a very long time. And then at the end of five weeks, you have to find out was your queen properly mated or not. If um, you bought some early queens this year and I did myself, you'll find that a lot of them came back um, improperly mated. Like I think Robert was saying that they got one in their package um, that the queen's just not doing what she's supposed to be doing. So if your hive hasn't built up past that deep within, you know, up to June, something else is going on and you need to check your bees. So I do want to talk about laying workers because this is something I see on Facebook quite a bit, um, the complaints that people have with their, their hives and trying to figure out is this healthy brood or is this not healthy brood? So how do you know when you have a laying worker? And it's usually in the top right hand corner, you can see there are multiple eggs per cell and in those eggs, they're going to turn into what you see on the bottom, which is drone brood. It's uh, infertile eggs and so therefore they can't turn into a worker bee and so they become a dud and eventually the hive creates this bacteria you can see in the top picture and the hive slowly dies out. So um, the other things that you can pay attention to is when you're opening up the hive, they'll have something called a queenless roar. And I don't know if you've ever observed when you're inside your colony and the sound that they make and you can hear the change when they start getting irritated with you being in there too long. Well, the queenless roar or a queenless hive has this roar about them that they sound loud. It's not always, but it is very common. Um, and, but sometimes they do it too when they have a virgin still running around in there because the pheromone is so weak. So do make sure that you do realize the difference. If you're seeing the shotgun pattern and you're seeing multiple eggs per cell, well, then most likely you have a laying worker and that's a situation you have to deal with. If you're not seeing all of those other stages and they still have a queenless roar, you might have a virgin queen still running around inside of your hive. So how late can you fix a laying worker hive? Um, to be honest with you, a laying worker hive is very, very hard to knock out of the situation and you're not really fixing it, you're kind of creating a new hive. And the reason that they're um, laying all these extra eggs is because there's not a queen, so the pheromone's not there. And so they're trying to create their own and so they are convincing themselves that they have a queen. So by just placing a mated queen in there, they're going to kill her because they already feel like they're making their own queen so they don't want this new queen that you introduced. What you have to do is you have to put at least one to two frames of capped brood inside of the colony so that the bees get knocked out of that broodless pheromone situation. And so once you have the brood emerging and the bees start realizing that they are going to be able to produce their own queen, then they calm down, they stop producing the drone, and they are more willing and receptive to take that queen. But technically, what you did was you made yourself a nuke by borrowing that brood and putting it in there. So you didn't really save the hive, you're actually kind of making a new one. So when your, your hive gets to the point that they're laying worker, they are unfortunately kind of already on the outskirts of being done. Um, however, if you have multiple hives, you're at a benefit and you can typically do something to make them better. My personal choice of what I do with a laying worker hive is I take one of my strong colonies, I lay down a piece of newspaper and I put the laying worker colony on top I let all of those bees go up, they knock the bees out of it, they clean out the cells, and then once that happens in about two weeks, I can pull that box back off of there and create a, a hive again. So although I'm losing a hive for a week, I'm recreating the hive two weeks later with healthy brood and hopefully we'll get a queen um, to put in there if I decide that's what I wanna do with it. Um, and also the one thing I also wanted to add was that excessive drone brood. So say I take this box and I put it on top of a, a colony. Well, that colony wasn't strong enough. So they couldn't keep up with all of the drone brood and the drone brood actually will rot. Um, as you can see in that top picture, and it will smell like a dead animal inside of the hive. And the, a lot of times that situation will trick people into thinking that they might have European or American fowl brood. So you just have to remember and pay attention. Oh, did I combine a laying worker? Did I have a situation like that first before you make the assumption that maybe you have a disease or bacterial instead? Emily, we have a question in the chat. Uh, okay, I don't even know how to look at that. <laughs> that's okay, I'm, I'm helping you with it. Thank you. Uh, it's, Michelle is asking, laying worker hives may not have the queenless roar, correct? 
Yes, they will not, they don't always have to have it. And you don't want to base your hive diagnosis off of what you feel is just the queenless roar. Look at your brood, look inside the cells. If you're seeing multiple eggs, if you're seeing a shotgun pattern, that kind of situation, those are your telltale signs. And then if you also hear this queenless roar, well, you know, now it's a three for three. And then talking about that American foul brood looking frame where you thought perhaps that, that could have been, um, I want to address, are my bees sick? How do you know if your bees are sick? First and foremost, if you are newer to beekeeping and you get into your hive and you think, oh, something is wrong with it, before you make any type of decision on it, ask for a second opinion from a more educated beekeeper. And the reason that I say that is because I actually know a professional beekeeper who accidentally told somebody to kill their hive, burn it, because they thought that they had American foul brood and the person did. And it was such a sad situation because once the, the sample came back from Beltsville, they found out it wasn't, it was actually just bacterial. Well, guess what? He just lost how much money in that beekeeping equipment and how much money in those bees. So before you jump to a conclusion, absolutely make sure that you have a second opinion before. Um, I'm gonna throw you out here, Randy Katz. <laughs> uh, Randy Katz is now your county inspector. He uh, will be able to assist you in situations where you feel like your bees are sick. A lot of times you could get away with just sending him pictures or an email and explaining that to him and seeing what his two cents are. Um, but he is going to be able to help people in, in that situation um, if, if it's necessary. So if you are seeing, now don't use Randy Katz as your mentor. You're only using him in a situation where you're like, oh, my bees are super sick. I think I need to do something about this. Hey, Mr. Inspector, can you please take a sample and send it to Beltsville? Or can you please give me your personal opinion? And uh, that's what he's there for. So um, the other thing, if you don't know, Honey Bee Healthy is what they use to help uh, treat European foul brood. So it wasn't last year, it was the year before I had a client that two of her hives had European foul brood. Uh, we were kind of the culprit for it spreading to two hives because we made a split. So we basically took a sick hive and split it in half. And so therefore that European foul brood grew once it was in two weak colonies, the bees couldn't keep up, keep up. So what you should do if you think you have European foul brood, now I wanna stress American foul brood is never treatable. You have to get rid of your equipment unless you're going to ozone it. I don't know much about ozoning, so I can't give my two cents on that. Um, but for European foul brood, you can drench your bees in honeybee healthy. And what I mean by drenching your bees is that you're actually going to make up your mixture and you're going to take like a little cup and you're going to slowly, please don't drown your bees, slowly kind of drizzle some of the honeybee healthy over top of the, the main cluster and the brood chamber of those bees. And the reason for that is because they're going to start cleaning themselves, cleaning up the hive and cleaning each other. And that's going to help work some of that bacteria out through their system and help them purge it from, from the hive. So, and then if you ever run into a situation where you think that you have poisoned bees, you need to report it to the pesticide division as soon as possible at the Department of Agriculture. Um, I'm sure that Randy could probably give you some contact information, but if you call the Department of Agriculture directly, they will be able to, to put you in contact with them. Um, I ran into a situation my third year where somebody had sprayed a retention pond and they killed 18 of my hives in a matter of two weeks. So uh, we watched our bees die and it was too late for the pesticide division by the time we had figured out we were allowed to call them to come out to sample them because the pesticide divisions explained that there's a half-life on these chemicals and therefore it had broken down and it would probably no longer test positive for certain things. And so they couldn't do anything with the sample that we were going to give them. So if you think that your bees are poisoned, call them immediately because there's a very strict amount of time. Now, disappointingly, I do have to say that just a person that has one or two hives uh, will probably, they're probably not gonna come out. It's gonna be very unfortunate. You may lose, lose your hives. Um, it does kind of happen here and there with farmers. Um, if you have your bees next to somewhere and, and the farmer sprays and they don't inform you. Um, it's usually typical for somebody that's more of a business situation. Like we had 18 hives, we were producing honey and selling it at farmer's markets. And so the uh, pesticide division came out to test for us. Uh, but when I had later tried to get help for somebody else as an inspector, I found out that they don't really do the onesie twosie kind of situation. 
Um, also, you can report it to your county inspector, like I said, and also to the EPA division uh, if you believe that somebody is misusing the chemicals or herbicides that they are, are using. Um, and then if you want, you can go to the Ohio Department of Agriculture website, that link that I had showed you guys earlier. And on there, you can see every year how many registered beekeepers there were. So 6,660, county apiary inspectors, 61, counties inspected, apiaries inspected, uh, you know, how many cases of foul brood, European foul brood. Now, when we're saying colonies with American foul brood or European, that is not a guess. That is a confirmed case of it um, by lab diagnosis. So we typically send uh, um, results out to Beltsville. I believe that they were closed. I'm not sure if they still are. Um, but now I believe that the Department of Agriculture can test as well when we get into this situation. So, but every year, if you have interest, you can get onto the website and find out how many beekeepers are there, how many colonies were inspected, uh, how often does American fowl brew get found and all of that fun stuff. And then I wanted to squeeze this in if I can. Hey, Robert, how are we on time? Like how much time do I have? Like, uh, we, we have a good, 20 minutes if it's okay. okay and if people need to leave we're recording this and I'll make it available uh, for you guys to download. Okay um, so I just wanted to address the flow hive because I am probably asked about that flow hive by every person that is not a beekeeper in the entire world and um, the idea is wonderful if you are an experienced beekeeper and you know what you're doing um, I would never recommend it to anyone that's under at least, I mean, two years, but for sure three, to be honest, because it wasn't until my third year that I really started to understand what I was doing inside of these highs and it started clicking. And the reason that I say that is because this ex very expensive contraption doesn't give you enough boxes. And so you will not survive winter with just these two boxes. The bottom one is your brood chamber. The top one is your food that you need for winter. Well, you've just taken all of your food out in that fancy little flow hive. So how are your bees going to survive winter? It's gonna be very disappointing that you spent $1,000 on this and then how much money are your bees and then you lose them year after year after year because you bought an Australian honey flow hive. And when I say that, it means Australia's winters are not as bad as ours and they also have a different type of honey flow. And so if you're deciding that you want to pick this type of hive to do with your bees, make sure you understand the basics, how many deeps that you would need before you can take that honey off the top of the hive. Um, one thing I like to tell people about, and I promise you this is not medical advice, if anyone's uh, familiar with homeopathic remedies, this is something that I use in my life and my family. Um, people react very strongly sometimes to bee stings, so I carry this, it's Apis mellifica, in my pocket, and it's a homeopathic remedy of bee stings. And so um, in situations where I get stung, and as there was a photo shoot I've done where I got stung in the eye, and then I had to do another photo shoot, my eye swelled. So I took this and it removed the swelling almost immediately. Who's clicking things? It was me, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is something that I just keep in the pocket of my suit. And I just kind of want to show you something that was kind of amazing experience to me the other day. Um, some of you might have actually seen this on my Facebook page, but um, my son had gotten stung by a bee. And if anything, these homeopathic remedies make my children think that they're taking medicine to make them feel better. And so it's kind of, you know, uh, they, they just automatically, everything's okay once this happens. So um, I put it in my pocket and then I had caught a swarm and I was trying to put the swarm so into I, a box. I was going through these swarms and um, apparently I've turned into a swarm. So uh, I'm not really sure. I don't want to show you the whole video. We don't have to waste time on that. But what I later found out was that I had that Apis mellifica in my pocket and the bees were actually so drawn to it that they were swarming my pocket, which I thought was pretty amazing. It was kind of uh, proof to me that, that this really does help, at least I think it does. Um, but so if you ever get stung and you have a really bad reaction and, and a doctor won't write you an EpiPen, this is something that would be safe that you could carry around with you until you, know, you can get into a situation where you're feeling better. 
Um, and so I just wanted to also offer out questions and answers. If you have anything that I discussed through this that uh, you didn't understand, I don't know how to read them if you're typing them out. Um, so maybe Robert can help me if, with that. So Matt is asking, I have a flow hive super only. Is that okay? We have normal brood boxes. So See, Matt has two brood boxes and his plan is to put two deeps and his plan is to put the flow hive concoction on top of those two. Um, I mean, if you're a first year beekeeper, like I said, I wouldn't recommend it because I think that it's very important for you to really understand your bees first. Um, but if, if you're wanting to do it, then that, that's your method. I mean, as long as you're going to have your two brew chambers, then that's, that's fine. Um, but I really want people to understand that if you do have the flow hive, that does not mean you are hands off. You still have to inspect your bees every seven to 10 days. It would be like somebody that bought an animal, um, a dog, a cat, a horse, and they didn't take care of it. You have to go through the colony. And if you don't, you could run into all the problems that I was talking about. Um, laying workers, bacterial infections, that kind of thing. So by looking at your brood chamber on a regular basis, you'll be able to avoid those problems. And then the flow hive may possibly work for you. Um, I mean, it, it should, I mean, you know, uh, as long as you're doing it correctly. Hey, hey Robert. Yes. The, the uh, just the, real quick, I, so the reason, I, I'm a one month beekeeper, not even a one year beekeeper, okay? so the reason I got that is because I didn't want to get all this other equipment to extract honey, but I still, I agree with you. I want to get into my brood boxes once a week and make sure everything's okay. So I, so to me, the draw was I don't have to buy all this extra other equipment to extract honey. And I thought, well, okay, that's probably a, a good, maybe medium solution to go to. So I don't have to have all that extra equipment. So that was kind of the draw as a, a new beekeeper for me to try to do that um but i would agree that yeah you gotta you still gotta watch your bees yeah so i was absolutely. trying to avoid the cost of extraction equipment and stuff like that yeah no I, that makes total sense for sure um the other thing too is that i always encourage people it's a learning experience you know um it may not be what i do but if that's what you choose and it's going to you know it's going to teach you something um i have a lot of people that do uh the long langstroth hives top bar hives i'm like anti-top bar hive big time but i've seen people get them through winter not very many but if that's your thing you're going to learn off of it and you're going to be educated in some form some way or another and so you're still learning so if that's the way you want to learn then it's still going to benefit you for sure and for those on this call especially new beekeepers the association that you belong to has an extractor that you can rent for three days for twenty dollars so if um, some of you uh, that, you know, hopefully this year will be able to extract some honey, uh, reach out to us. Chris right now is in charge of it, Chris Hirston. And so reach out, send an email to officers at summitbeekeepers.com and, you know, we'll get you hooked up. Hello, this is Mohamed Farawi. Okay. Hello, Mohamed. Uh, Hi, Robert. Uh, I am Elis. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. It's very beneficial, as always. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question. I, uh, I, I think, Rob, you helped me get those, uh, get some uh, used tools from, I uh, uh, forgot his name already, uh, Rob, I believe. Uh, and uh, yesterday, after I inspected my hives, uh, I, I, I had two hives, like one from I believe Queen Wright, and the other one was a nook from uh, someone here. Um, and uh, when I inspected yesterday, I feel that uh, I need to add another box. And I got all these used equipment. Um, so I, I, I feel like the, the, the bees were crowded and stuff, so I added the second. But I, was, I didn't know if it's better to add, like, empty frames or because those are used and they have, like, uh, the guy left them with, uh, you know, some of them have pollen, some uh, he extracted honey from them. I don't know if that's too much work for the bees to clean them and stuff, um, or is that okay? Yeah, so the bees will will clean them. Um, you know, I, I've seen the frames you're talking about. Uh, some of them had honey, some of them had nothing. 
Um, so the bees will take care of them. I, I have, you don't want to have any frames with mold. You know, some people put yeah, on right. the sure. frame and they think, okay, well, the bees will take care of it. Well, they don't have hands. They're going to clean it with their uh, mouths and their, you know, and their tongue. And you don't want them eating that stuff and spreading it all over the hive. So just make sure there's no mold on them, put them in there and they'll clean them up and they'll yeah, no, try I... the wax and repair them. Yeah, I inspected that. Well, Emily, second... do you agree? I use moldy frames all the time. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so I, I don't, just because the bees do clean them up um, pretty well. And I've also seen them move into old cavities and uh, lots of funky looking places and lots of funky looking comb. I've seen them clean out mice nests. I've seen a propolis mice into hives. Um, and then you're, so I personally don't mind gross, disgusting frames. It's just that you don't want to put those bad frames inside a very weak colony. You want to make sure that they are a strong colony. Right. Yeah. The first hive, the first box I started with, uh, it was also used. So they cleaned them really well. I was uh, you know, amazing when I checked them. It was like big, <laughs> very clean. Yeah. Um, and then when I added the second, I was just worried because, you know, they're dripping all that dirt on top of the clean one on the, the one that they already built. And so I was, uh, no, you're, I mean, they, they clean everything up. You really don't have to worry about it. Okay, um, you good. do need to be cautious. I mean, it sounds like Robert knew who you were buying the beekeeping equipment from, but buying you <laughs> is um, kind of frowned upon in the beekeeping realm just because it could put you at a higher risk of having something, um, some type of bacterial infection sure. uh, yeah. or European foul beard or American right, foul beard. Right. I but, asked that the question before I bought the equipment. I yep. asked him, you know, why did why you're selling? Uh, did you have this uh, American foot brewers and stuff? So he yep. said no. The other I, thing that you can do, and I have done in the past when helping other people do something like that, um, you can uh, email the State Department and you can say, mm -hmm. hey, uh, this beekeeper says that they're selling their equipment, and I just kind of wanted to know, would you purchase equipment from this person? And okay. um, I have been told people not like who not to purchase from, and they're mm -hmm. still trying to sell equipment. So that's also another way to check it and and find out for sure if they sound like they're a responsible beekeeper. Okay, okay. And my, my second question that I, I see some chats uh, about it uh, before, like when do you sec when you when do you add the second uh, box? Usually, you, you say uh, when you're um, eighty percent you know, uh, eight out of 10, but I, I don't know what eight out of 10 means, you know, because like in my case, they're used, you know, I was yesterday when I inspected, I just added because I found almost all the frames were full of honey, uh, well, and nectar, pollen, and cap brood and eggs and stuff like that. So that's why I added the, I, I found there is no, almost yeah, no so, room. So Mohammed, uh, uh, eight frames mean eight okay when you see eight frames, it's eight frames of bees, not necessarily drawn frames. You know, people that have been doing this for a while, they have drawn frames and they have an advantage because the bees don't have to build these frames and waste 16 pounds of nectar to make one pound of honey. And so when you look at them, when you open that box and look inside, you want to see bees on eight frames on both sides. And uh -huh. that's how you count your eight uh, frames. Okay. Not necessarily they drew 10 frames of wax, but they're only on six frames of brood, you're still not ready to add. Well, well, uh, like we, we could, you could find like few bees in one frame and what do you mean see bees in one in Okay, frame? so the, the frame like how is many covered bees? with bees, <laughs> totally covered with bees. Totally covered, frame. okay. Yes. All right, thank that you very much. That doesn't mean, you know, one frame has two inches exposed, you don't do it. You know, if, if they're 90% covered that frame, you count it as one. Okay. All right. All right. Perfect. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank and you, uh, we have Jenny Hamilton is asking, okay, so we added the second super uh, or the second brood. Now, when do we add supers? It's the same theory. And correct me if I'm wrong, Emily. Uh, you, you have eight frames drawn. You're a new beekeeper. Eight frames drawn and they're full of bees. Add your, if you want to add a queen excluder, add it and add your super on top. And they'll start drawing it, especially now when you have nectar flow, what you're going to find out is later in the season, there's nothing you can do to get your bees to draw frames. This is your opportunity. So add it in there. Don't give them too much room. You give them too much room and they can't defend their territory. You're going to end up with a lot of ants and beetles in your hive. 
So be careful how much you add, but you add one box at a time, wait until they draw it and you see eight frames of bees in there and then you add the third one. Uh, Emily, people want to know what's up with that picture. Uh, uh, that was my elderberry uh, advertisement. So we sell elderberry syrup infused with raw honey. And um, I just decided to, um, uh, it was a remake of like the milk ad where I have the purple on my lip instead of milk because I'm drinking the elderberry syrup. I just think that I'm funny. Hello? Uh, we have, we have Hello. a question from Sharon. Uh, Sharon is saying, my hive swarmed on 425. I thankfully was able to catch that swarm. Uh, I had been, it had been too cold before and after this day for me to be able to quickly inspect um, the hive without chilling the brood chamber. I'm not that quick at inspections. How do you inspect in the spring to prevent swarms from the temperature, if the temperatures are low? I guess, at what temperature do you inspect, Emily, and how long are you supposed to stay in the box inspecting? So I inspect usually over 40. Um, I know that sounds kind of cold to some people, but for the most part, um, I kind of, I mean, if, I, I think it was probably closer to 45. There were some pretty cold mornings though with the chill. Um, and what I do is I just pull out one of the outside frames that don't have brood on it. So I have a lot of room to work with in my colony. And so then that way I can push the frames, pull out the brood, look at it to see what's going on and then put it back down inside of the hive. Um, if you're not comfortable or you think that it takes too long for you to be able to do that, you would be able to monitor them by a week or two weeks later. Um, at that point, you know, once your hive swarms, you're going to be looking for a new queen within five weeks. So within five weeks, if you hadn't seen any change, well, she definitely didn't come back. Uh, if, if they are still thriving, then she did mate properly. But when they swarm that early in, in the season, sometimes you risk them coming back improperly mated uh, because of the weather and because there's not enough drones. So always make sure that that queen, her pattern and the way that she's laying, since she was a very early swarm, make sure that they are doing exactly what they're doing. And she's you know, now in her second box at this point instead of just one. Um, we have somebody asking how many supers do you leave for your bees? Uh, for you, yeah, for bees to have for the winter? Um, I usually just do two deeps or four mediums. I like to run mediums, but I also have a lot of equipment that um, was given to me by beekeepers I work with, so I don't have all of that. So I usually do two deeps or four mediums um, through the winter. Uh, Matt wants to know if you have alderberries. Uh, what is there an, an maybe a business card or a number or a way for people to find you, Emily? Um, yeah, just go to Mueller, M U E L L E R, Honeybee, and uh, our website pops up, our Facebook pops up. If you type in Honeybee Rescue, we pop up. Um, any of those, you can contact me through there, our Facebook page. But yeah, our main production, because every beekeeper does honey, we moved away from just honey. Uh, we now do elderberry syrup. So um, we sell in 50 different stores around Northeast Ohio. Yeah, that was my attempt to be funny, like at your got milk stuff. So I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm like zoned out over here. I didn't understand because he's reading them to me. So I think we covered all the questions. If not, right. uh, if you guys want to unmute yourself and ask a question, we got a couple minutes here. People were asking, where do you get your Apis Malefica? Um, I order it online, but you can get it at almost any health store. Um, so in this area, Krieger's, Seven Grains, uh, Mustard Seed, all of those places should have it. Um, Kent Co-op will have it. Their whole, whole foods, but yeah, Amazon, I herb, that kind of thing. Um, and I just, I usually order six of them because I typically give a couple bottles away to people who have bad reactions when I'm at their hives helping or inspecting or something like that. Um, and then I have like two in every car and then, you know, one in every room in my house just because I do that apparently. Great. Hey Emily, this this was great because I, I got my bees. I think Robert knows this. I got my bees on Mother's Day, is where I picked up my two nooks, 
And everything that you talked about in here is, ex I've experienced it all, I think, so far. <laughs> Without Robert's help, I would have lost one high for sure. But I mean, we've heard the, how the bees sound when they're queenless, they're yep. more aggressive. Yep. Um, and then when the queen comes back, made it, I mean, today they were very calm. Um, it, it, we've seen it all. So, I mean, you hit everything in this presentation. I thought it was fantastic. Nice job. Awesome. I'm so glad my, uh, I'm sorry that my four-year-old decided to <laughs> sneak in. So <clears throat> hey, you're a mom first. We understand. Thank you for your time. I want to share one thing with you guys. Um, I use a, an app. I just started using it and I know many of you will keep journals, uh, especially beginners. And then second year you drop it a little bit and third year you barely bother. I, I have 10 hives right now. Uh, three survived the winter. I had to split a couple of them. I caught two swarms thanks to Emily and, uh, you know, and I bought four packages. It's really hard for me. And I don't know if it's my age or what. I turned 55 and my memory is gone. Uh, I, I start inspecting. By the time I get to hive number five, I have no idea what happened with hive number one. <laughs> and so I found this tool and it's otter.ai, O-T-T-E-R dot AI. I'll put it in the chat. And so I, I, I turn it on on my phone and I start speaking what I'm observing. And uh, first time I overdid it, I had 20 pages of dictation. <laughs> so it will dictate it for you. It will type it. And when you go to the office, to your computer, you log on to your account. And now you can say, okay, hive number one, there are eight frames of bees. I see some cups you know, a lot of drones, whatever you, you want to comment. And as you speak them, it's typing them for you. And it's a great tool because I can go back to hive number three, three weeks ago and tell you exactly what I saw in my hive. So if you guys uh, um, have iPhones or whatever, you know, they give you 10 hours for free, which is a lot of time for many beekeepers, especially if you have one or two hives. It's a great tool to document your system and three, four, five days later, go back and revisit what you found or maybe for reference, hey, what happened with hive number three? Um, I don't remember seeing swarm cups. Why did they swarm? You know, and you can go back two or three weeks and find out what happened. All right. If you don't mind, I'm gonna sneak out of here because I have a baby upstairs crying I can hear. Thank you, Emily. Before you leave, I need to take control of the meeting. So give me one second, okay? Okay. Thank you for doing all of that stuff. I know. Thank you for your time. A lot of good information. We love it. And just as to put out there too, um, I do make YouTube videos and I post a lot of very short clips on, you know, just little things you can do in the apiary. Uh, I just did one on how to wax your frames out in the apiary when the bees are building off of your comb. So that's all under Mueller Honeybee as well. Uh, one second, Emily. I'm struggling trying to get to your control here. There it is. Uh, participants. All right. And I'll disconnect from your computer. Thank you for your time, Emily. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Well done. Thank you. Anybody else? You guys have any questions that we can answer or... Will we be able to listen to this again later? Because I, I missed the middle part of it. Yes. So um, um, it's recording into the cloud, uh, but I disconnected from Emily's computer. I hope she won't shut down her computer because it needs to stream it. Uh, so I'll text her real quick. You're fine. Uh, I'm going to leave it on. I'm just going to run upstairs if you can still hear me. Okay, great. So just leave it on uh, and it's going to finish streaming to the cloud and then I'll download it tomorrow. We'll make it available somehow. Sounds good. Thank you. All right, great. And I'm going to put the app for the recording. It's called otter.ai. I just put it in the chat room. O-T-T-E-R dot A-I.